Is it about changing the, the world? problem that's right Or is it your you? generation's time? Let's find out. Hi, guys. <laughs> My mom is a strong black woman who raised her kids to have the same sense of strength and pride. The spirit was epitomized by a single wall in our small two-bedroom apartment on the south side of Chicago. Two pictures hung proudly, one larger-than-life photo of my siblings and I, and the other, a picture of my mom at 12 years old, staring into the eyes of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When I was younger, I used to stand on my tippy toes, stare at that picture, close my eyes tightly, and just pretend that it was me, gazing up at the man who revolutionized the civil rights movement, who marched on Washington, and who transformed a generation by his words, I have a dream. But I did get to meet him. Now, obviously, it didn't meet Dr. King, but I met a man named Dr. Vincent Harding. He worked with Dr. King from day one and even wrote some of his most iconic speeches. You see, this was a really important moment for me as a kid because it was the first time that I realized that it wasn't just Dr. King who led this revolution, but he was surrounded by a movement made up of anonymous extraordinaries. Anonymous extraordinaries are people who work selflessly and vigorously for what they believe in. People who are motivated by conviction and not recognition. It took me a long time to realize the significance of this moment until I was much older. And like I said, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in a rough, poor neighborhood, but it didn't really matter to me as a kid because I literally have the most incredible family in the world. Two things that I did struggle with a lot um, growing up was one, that my dad has been sick my whole life. Uh, he suffers from Parkinson's and pancreatitis, and as a kid, it was so hard for me to watch my hero in so much pain. Um, and my other issue was with me. I guess you could say I had an identity crisis. Uh, I had to move four times during high school, and my freshman year, I went to an extremely racist high school. These kids were so cruel. They gave us hate letters, wrote terrible things on our lockers, and because I'm biracial, they would tell me, you can't be both. You have to choose, black or white. And in the end, I just resented being either. And then all of a sudden, my senior year rolls around 2008, and being mixed, being racially ambiguous, is this new cool fad. Like, oh, Natalie, now it's OK for you to like you. You're pretty now. I was over it. I was really tired of caring about what other people thought, and I just wanted to do whatever I could do to hurry up, go through my classes, whatever school I was going to be at next, and graduate. It wasn't until I was 17 and I saw a film called Invisible Children that uh, something happened. Child soldiers, children as young as my nephews, being abducted, given AK-47s, and forced to kill. Not just anyone, but oftentimes forced to kill their own parents, their own siblings. A rebel army committing mass murder for no political or religious reason just because. 25 years. 25 years this conflict has been going on. I'm 20 years old, so that makes this conflict five years older than me. One man. One man with one charismatic voice, started this whole thing. His name is Joseph Coney. When I saw this film, something happened. Something started kind of stirring inside of me, and I couldn't identify what it was. I didn't know if it was rage, if it was pity, if I felt guilty because this was the first time I'd heard about a 25-year-long war. I couldn't even give it a name. All I knew is that it kicked me off my ass, and I started asking questions. What do I do? What can one 17-year-old do? You've got to give me something. And they gave me something. The founders and filmmakers at Invisible Children told me that there was this bill, that if we could just get this bill passed, it would do two things. One, it would apprehend Joseph Coney and the top commanders in his rebel army. And two, it would provide funding for the recovery of these regions that have been devastated by 25 years of war. And I was like, done. Let me at it. I swear I will do whatever I can to make this happen. So myself and 99 other idealistic 18 to 20 year olds hopped on a plane to intern in San Diego with Invisible Children. I was postponing college. We weren't getting paid for this. And you could call it irresponsible or crazy. My parents did. But for us, it would have been insane not to go. We all felt this urgency, and we would do whatever it took to pass this bill. So we were given our first task. We were going to plan an event called the Rescue of Joseph Coney's Child Soldiers, where participants would come in 100 cities worldwide and rally in their city center until a celebrity or a political figure came and used their voice on behalf of these child soldiers. And at that point, each city was rescued. But the catch was, we weren't leaving the cities until we were rescued. 
I was given Chicago and nine other cities, and I told my bosses, I was like, if we're going for big name people, why not go for the Queen Bee, right? Why not go for Oprah Winfrey? They thought I was a little idealistic, but I mean, we were trying to think big. We were doing an impossible thing, so why not try to reach more impossible things? And so we had from January and April to get this done. <coughs> this is the number of hours that I spent on logistics, from getting permits to rallying participants and finding venues. This is the number of times that I was rejected by celebrities, agents, or politician secretaries. That is the number of, uh, the amount of money that I spent personally on Red Bull and Diet Coke to stay awake during this movement. <laughs> can judge me if you want to. That is my hospital bill from the kidney infection I got from an overconsumption of caffeine due to this <laughs> event. These were just some of the ridiculous things that we did to try and pull this event off. And so April 24th first rolls around and the event begins. 100 cities around the world, they were beautiful. Six days later, all the cities were rescued but one, Chicago. So we were waiting in the city. People started coming from all over the world, all over the country to be reinforcements and join their voice with ours. And finally on May 1st, we wrapped ourselves around Oprah's studio and we got her attention. This is a clip from a film called Together We Are Free, documenting the rescue event and my attempt to get Oprah. First, when I drove into the office this morning, there was a giant, when you all came in, was there a group outside? Yeah. Holding up signs asking if I would talk to them for just five minutes, so I was happy to do so. And uh, they are with a group called Invisible Children, and I told this group outside that I'd give them a minute to state their case. Oprah, thank you so much for having us. Uh, basically, these folks out here have seen the story of 30,000 children abducted by a rebel leader named Joseph Coney. And they're out here in solidarity, and they have been out here for six days. Uh, this started 100,000 people worldwide. Now it's down to 500, standing strong, so that you can raise the profile of this issue, and we can end the longest running war in Africa and rescue those kids that are child soldiers still in East Africa. Oprah, I have to say this girl, Natalie, here, she's 18 years old, she was an intern for us this year, and she said, my one goal is to get Oprah. She had 2,000 people come out on Saturday, but it rained. She stood here in the rain with 50 people. When they heard she was here, hundreds started coming. People are here from Mexico, Australia. Natalie's 18, don't think you're too young. You can change the world any day. Start now. Start today. Was it worth it? that this is the moment in my life, the pinnacle that made me an extraordinary. And it was an awesome moment. I mean, I was on top of the world. 10 million people watched the Oprah Winfrey show. But looking back, that wasn't it. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, it was a great moment. It made for a heck of a profile picture on Facebook for a week. <laughs> but, but I had been extraordinary all along. And I wasn't alone. You see, even though my story was featured in this film, I was just one of 100 interns who worked their tails off to make this happen. I'm up in the air, but the guy that I'm sitting on his shoulders, he's my best friend. His name is Johannes Oberman, and Johannes worked with me from day one in Chicago. Just as long hours, just as many sleepless nights as I did. The girl on the right, her name's Bethany Bilesma. Bethany planned New York City and Boston, and they were seriously the most beautiful events that we held. The girl on the left, her name's Colleen. Colleen moved to Mexico, moved, for three months to plan five events there, only to be kicked out the day before the events because of the swine flu. And then there was this family. This family, they didn't get to come to the rescue, they couldn't make it out, but they ordered 100 boxes of pizza for us, delivered them to the corner of Michigan and Randolph where we were all silently protesting. You see, it was people like this doing whatever they could, simultaneously, single-mindedly, without a care to who was watching, that made this happen. It wasn't about us getting on Oprah, because when I got down from their shoulders, the war hadn't ended. 
It was about that bill. Oprah was just a checkpoint on the way to that bill. That bill was the point. That bill is what we had our eyes set on from day one. That was going to help us end Africa's longest running war. And that is what brought 100,000 people out to the rescue event from around the world. And it paid off. A 10 days after we were on Oprah, the bill was introduced into Congress. A year after that, it got unanimously 267 co-sponsors in Congress. And then one week after that, President Obama signed our bill into law. <laughs> and none of, us, none of us interns got to be there. We didn't get to be there in this moment. Our founders were there. They're the guys cheesing in the background. But <laughs> That moment right there is what made all of it worth it. It's what 100,000 anonymous extraordinaries worked for so hard to make that happen. You know, the Oprah moments, they prove that the supposedly impossible can be done. They inspire us, they boost our confidence, but the moment isn't a movement. Even a lot of those moments strung together don't fuel a movement. What fuels a movement are the anonymous extraordinaries behind it. You know, for me, what kept me pushing on through the rescue was the thought of those child soldiers. It became personal. I was able to go to Africa at one point. I met these incredible people. I have friends that have been living in this conflict their entire life, and it was personal to me. But that doesn't have to be what drives you. You know, you may want to be the next Shepard Ferry, or the next J.K. Rowling, or the next whoever. It doesn't matter, but whatever you want, chase after it with everything that you have not because of the fame or the fortune, but solely because that's what you believe in, because that's what makes your heart sing. That's what your dance is. That's, that's what is gonna define our generation. When we start chasing and fighting after the things that we love and that we want to fight for. I cared too much in high school about what people thought about me. Even, that's what's so awesome about this conference is so many of you are so young. Find that thing that inspires you, that you love, and just chase after it. You know, fight for that, because that is what is going to change this world, and that is what defines us. Despite what people think, my Oprah moments, my being on TED, doesn't define me. Because if you were to follow me home to LA, you would see me waiting tables and nannying to pay the bills as I chase after my dream of becoming a filmmaker. In the small, anonymous, monotonous, every single day acts, I have to remind myself to be extraordinary. And believe me, when the door is closed and the cameras are off, it's tough. But if there's one thing that I want to drive home to you, one thing that I can say, not just to you, but to myself, is that is the acts that make us extraordinary, not the Oprah moments. Thank you. I want to be an anonymous extraordinary. Being a part of the bid for the European Youth Capital 2019 will help me achieve my ambitions. I want to be a part of the change. I want to grow up in a better place. If we, the young people, of this area are not leading this process, this bid will not work. We have to get energised, we have to believe, and we need to give our friends the hope that we will want. It's our time to shine. We have to dream and get creative. Think up ideas and projects that will create an amazing programme to make Derry and Strabane, European Youth Capital 2019, a place to be. Our story and amazing programme will convince the European Youth Forum to make us the European Youth Capital in 2019. We will open the gates and invite friends from all over Europe to come and visit us. We will show them how amazing this place where we work, live, learn and play is today. We got involved. We set up a group to meet and think about what we would like to see happen in the place where we live. We want the people who make decisions to listen to what we have to say. Get involved. Be a champion of EYC19. Become your own champion. Be the person with the ideas for the programme. Get friends involved. Start talking, Facebooking, tweeting and texting about EYC19. I want more big events and concerts, places to go and hang out with friends and meet new ones. Here's how to support EYC 2019.